Okay, so thank you everybody for attending. Uh, I'm working at Open Zeppelin, and this talk talks about like five smart contract pattern, but that's actually a lie. The real thing I want to discuss is what I think are the good mindset when writing solidity contract. And basically, the pattern I'm going to show you are more like examples of uh, what I think can be fun development in solidity and how I think it aligns with the good good uh, development practices. For, okay, yeah, so I think one of the two main points I want to make today is that a lot of the ecosystem's value is a result of smart contract composability. Uh, that's particularly true of DeFi. And the first thing you should do when writing a smart contract is make sure that you are leveraging as much composability as possible and trying to make sure that your contract can interface with all the existing tooling that would be relevant. An example is people always ask us like, hey, can we make an ownable contract uh, payable, like someone could buy it? And this makes really no sense because there is already a lot of tooling for buying assets and that's the NFT space. In the NFT space, you can just buy anything from OpenSea or Rarible or any other marketplaces. And we don't want to redeploy that for, for, the, NFT, for the ownable contracts that, that exist. So the idea is that when ownability is just like the ownership of, of a contract in order to, to have access to it, to some admin functions, well, you could just turn that into an ERC721. And, and this is how you would do it. Basically, you can very simply say like, hey, my owner is just the owner of a specific token on an ownership registry, and I can have an only mo owner modifier for that. And when I want to transfer ownership, the only thing I will have to do is go to this ownership registry and try to transfer the corresponding token. Now, on the ownership registry, you would have to override the is approval owner function to allow that, but that's very easy to do. And so here in this example, you have a vesting factory. This is actually live on mainnet. And when you want to deploy a new vesting wallet with a beneficiary for it, well, here the beneficiary is just the owner of the NFT on this factory. And when I deploy a new contract, I just create a new clone, I initialize it, and, and I mean the token. And that's the equivalent of my owner if the contracts were ownable. The difference is here, my contract show up on OpenSea and I can basically sell it or transfer it very easily. Uh, if you want to go a bit further, you could even have like a universal address ownership registry, which I think is pretty fun because it allows you to get rid of the minting part uh, by just saying that, hey, by default, all the tokens are already minted and they are owned by the address that corresponds to the token ID. I mean, all the tokens ID that matches an address in hexadecimal form. And then you can just say that, hey, it's not possible to burn them. You would just send them back to the original owner. And there is this is approval ownership that I, I'm doing some fancy stuff with, with codes, but you don't need to care about that. And, and this can just be another approach. I think it's nice, and it, it shows creative use of ERC721s. Um, and another thing we use is that ownable, obviously, is something that a lot of people are familiar with, but the granularity is, is really bad. Uh, sometimes you have different admin functions in your contract that you want to have different access for, and access control does that pretty well. Access control is provided by Open Zeppelin. The thing is that oh, Access control is maybe a bit more difficult to work with because you cannot transfer a role. You need to grant it to someone else and then either get it revoked or renounce it. And so it's very nice for some users, but at the same time, ownability has some advantages. So let's just combine both. Let's just make a contract that uh, as an owner and the owner is basically the default admin role. And then you just cannot grant or revoke this default admin role because that's controlled by the ownership part. But the owner still is the admin, so it can grant any other one. And this, here it's ownable, but it could be the ownable registry that we showed just before. So you could have a contract where the owner is the NFT holders. And then you have all these access controls that are managed in that way. Or you could be creative and use ERC 1155s here. And so yeah, that, that's just some small ideas, but it's not very complex code. I think everybody can understand that. But the point I really want to make is that you can combine tooling together and combine contracts to make sure that everything is as basically as seamless as possible. Uh, the second thing I want to, to present quickly is that uh, the ecosystem is constantly changing and, and basically when you write a contract, I mean, you can make your contract upgradable, but even without the upgradability part, you really need, need to care about 
what is going to be the life cycle of my contract and are there small tricks that I could use that will make my user's life better in the long run. And that's for the users, but also for like the UI designers or and basically anybody in this space. So these are just two small pieces of code, like point four and five that uh, I came up with very recently. And I think that's, that's things that are, are interesting uh, because we never expect a hard fork to happen until it actually does and people start trying to do a proof of fork blockchain and then the bridges that are on this proof of fork chain starts breaking and that's a pain. So you could imagine having this very small piece of code here that basically takes no size on, on, on chain that just gives you two modifier that verifies that the chain ID uh, that you're currently using is the one that was registered in immutable storage when the contract was deployed. And then you could do that to create some kind of bridge where actually most of the function remains completely trustless uh, with this only initial chain modifier. But if for any reason uh, there were to be a hard fork, the version of the bridge that is on the chain that changes the chain ID, then all those would be automatically disabled and you would get into recovery mode when some like multisig would be able to take over. And this multisig is not a threat for the user on the legitimate chain because because of this only fork chain, like this admin cannot do anything nasty to your users. But that's that's an exit point that would have saved some pain. I mean, it was on the proof of fork chain, so maybe we don't care a lot, but who knows? Maybe there will be more legitimate forks at some point in Ethereum's life cycle. And another one is that that's something we provide as OpenZeppelin and that's what we call the multi cold contract. And that's very simple, it's just one endpoint, one small functions that allows you to delegate to yourself with an array of data. And that's very easy for you to integrate into any of your contract and I don't think there is, there is any reason not to do it. And the way it's being done is earlier we saw this example here and here you have this multi call that maybe you didn't see because it's red and black so it's not really visible. But what it allows you to do is when you want to create a new vesting for one of your investors or, or someone, well, if you have 10 or 20 investors, maybe you don't want to do 20 transactions that do 20 calls to this new vesting function. So what you do is just that you encode, like you have a map of entry and you encode the function using like Ether JS or Web3 or whatever you like. And then you just have to do a single call. So there is a single transaction here that you have to wait for. And what it will do, it will basically um, run like all these, these these operations so you could deploy 20 vesting at a time or you could do an approve and some something else or you could batch transaction together like you don't need to wait for account abstraction to batch transaction you can already do it at the contract level i mean providing that the target is the same contract for all the sub calls and that's as simple as including that so yeah it Keep in mind that there are all these nice tricks that could possibly help your users down the line. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to have that in mind when building contracts and try to be creative. That's it. Yeah, so I'm going to repeat the question for, for the stream and, and the live. And uh, the question was about like, can access control be used for smart wallets? Is that, that's it basically, I think. Uh, well, uh, it really depends what kind of smart wallet you want to build. Um, there are different kinds of smart wallets. If it's just something that you are the sole owner of, I'm not sure it brings anything new to the table. Uh, but if you are doing a multi-sig, maybe it will be relevant. I mean, my opinion is that a time lock, for example, is a kind of smart wallet because it's just someone that will manage asset and do operation, but with specific rules. And in the open Zeppelin time lock, we use access control to separate the role of the proposers from the executors, from the admin that may have the right to cancel potentially. So yes, if you are building a multi-sig and you want to have different privileged access, maybe having an overseer that is able to recover in case of, 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 of issue, uh, having signers, having proposers, that basically you're turning your multi-sig into some governance mechanism, which, which it basically is, what a multi-sig is a governance mechanism. So yes, you could use access control. Uh, hey, uh, in your example with multi call that you've shown, we are deploying the same method like a bytecode for this method in every contract. Wouldn't it be better if we have it deployed separately? Yes, it would, but it's not possible right now. So like if we had uh, EIP 3074 live, 
we could just have this make, use this OS and OS call mechanism to do batching transaction, and and you would not have to include that in your contract. Uh, thing is that this is not available now. It will not be available until at least Shanghai and maybe later. Um, so I think the bytecode increase is is really small compared to the the value that is added to your contract right now. But yeah, in the long run, hopefully we would have all this supported at the at the execution level layer. Okay, uh, great talk. By the way, uh, in the ownable ERC seven twenty one part, you were talking about how you could basically ditch the ownable the ownable library, right? What what advantage? I I kind of missed the point of like what's the advantage of implementing the ownership inside the ERC seven twenty one logic instead of just bringing ownable? Is it just like bytecode size, or is there any other advantage that I'm missing? No, the real advantage is in in composability. The example is, for example, your your ownable contract. It could be tied to assets. Maybe you would want to consider that as a class of its own that you would be able to lend against collateral, or maybe it's a, maybe it's like a, a vesting wallet that is basically a future, uh, a financial future that you want to sell on Uniswap on, on OpenSea. Uh, right now, you cannot sell a non-able contract on OpenSea, but you can sell an NFT. So the way here is to make sure that your contract is compatible with all the tooling that exists out there, OpenSea and others. Also, just being able to see the ownership in your Zerion or any wallet you use, that's also something nice. Thanks. Thank you.